Hey everyone, Path here, and in this video we will be looking at an important group of differential operators known as gradient, divergence, and curl. These are often shortened to grad, div, and curl, and they're used very regularly in the world of physics as well as elsewhere. So we'll start by understanding what each one of these actually means, and then we'll be looking at some applications. To understand the grad, div, and curl operators, we need to start by thinking about this downward pointing triangle known as the nabla or del. Del can be thought of as a vector. In three dimensions, it looks something like this. The components of the vector are partial derivative d by dx, partial derivative d by dy, and partial derivative d by dz. Each one of these measures essentially how quickly a particular quantity changes over a small distance in the x direction, y direction, and z direction. Now, if you've seen my recent Poisson equation video and you're familiar with partial derivatives as well as del, then feel free to skip to this timestamp here. So let's take a more detailed look at del. Now, for example, if we've got a packet of flour and we open this packet and we decide to squish it, so the flour goes everywhere. And then we plot how much flour is found at every point along the x direction. We can see that our flour distribution would look something like this. Lots of flour near the origin and then less and less the further we get away from the origin. Let's also say that we label this flour distribution as f and let's now try and find df by dx. This simply measures how quickly our flower distribution changes as we move along the x-axis. We can think of this as measuring the gradient or slope of our flower distribution function. Over here, for example, our flower distribution drops off very quickly, so the gradient is steep. And hence, df by dx has a large size, and of course is negative because the flower is decreasing. Whereas in this region, the amount of flower is not changing a huge amount. Therefore, the gradient is shallow and df by dx has a small magnitude and is again negative because the flower is decreasing as we move from left to right. Basically, d by dx of our flower distribution f is simply measuring how quickly the flower distribution changes. Now, we could apply this nabla operator to our function f, and we would get, in the first instance, df by dx, as we've already seen, except the nabla operator has these weird curly d's. They're not normal d's. Now, as it turns out, these curly d's are representing what's known as a partial derivative. And luckily, these are fairly simple to think about, at least in a basic way. If we realize that our flower distribution, for example, doesn't just vary over the x direction, but it also varies in other directions, for example, the y direction, then we can understand that the curly d's in df by dx mean that we're only measuring the change in the x direction whilst keeping everything else constant. Similarly, the curly df by dy isolates out the change in the flower distribution in the y direction whilst keeping everything else constant. So we're not having to worry about the change in the x direction. Anyway, so that's what del ends up representing. And as we've already seen, this is what del looks like in three dimensions. If we're only working in two dimensions, then del would look like this and so on. We'll notice that del is a vector and it contains partial derivatives, which are studied in calculus. And hence del is an operator in the area of mathematics known as vector calculus. But we keep saying this word operator. What does it actually mean? Well, the nabla operator can operate on or do stuff to certain mathematical entities. In this case, scalar fields or vector fields. A scalar field is basically a field of numbers or values. In other words, every point in a given space, whether that's real space or some abstract space that we're considering, can be assigned a value. We can use scalar fields to represent things like altitude on a map. In this particular case, we're using it to represent how high above sea level you would be if you were to stand on that point of the Earth. Or it could be used to represent the amount of flour found in a given region of space after we'd squished our bag of flour. And of course, those are just two of the more physical examples. See if you can come up with your own example of how we can use scalar fields. Now, the del operator can be used to find out how quickly our scalar field changes at every point. In other words, we can find the gradient of the scalar field. Let's stick with our height above sea level example from earlier. By applying the del operator to our scalar field h, we get something like this. The diagram shows the gradient of our scalar field h. At each point, we see that there is an arrow or a vector, and each vector points in the direction that the scalar field increases most quickly. So for example, if our scalar field looks something like this, and we focus in on the point in the middle, then we can see that the scalar field increases most quickly in this direction. So in our diagram of the gradient of our field f, we would get a vector pointing in that direction. And of course, the size or magnitude of that vector represents exactly how much our scalar field is changing. So the crux of the matter is that applying our nabla operator to a scalar field gives us a vector field that represents the rate and direction of fastest change of our original scalar field. 
By the way, a vector field is just a field where we can assign a vector to every point in that space. And in this case, we can see that the gradient of a scalar field will end up being a vector field. However, a vector field is not always restricted to just being the gradient of a scalar field. We can have other vector fields that aren't necessarily the gradient of a scalar field too. For example, we can think of a vector field that represents the direction in which wind is flowing. The direction of each vector tells us the direction in which air particles are moving at that point in space. And the magnitude or size of the vector tells us how quickly they're moving, the speed of the particles. Also in physics, we can use a vector field to represent the electric field created by charged particles, which actually represents the following. If we were to take a small positively charged particle and place it at a particular point in the electric field, then the field lines tell us the size and direction of the force that that positive charge would experience. Now here's something interesting we can find out about every vector field. Let's imagine that we think of some imaginary sphere in this region of space. We can measure exactly how much electric field enters our sphere, and equally we can measure exactly how much electric field leaves our imaginary sphere. Here we see a certain number of long arrows entering our sphere, which means that a certain amount of electric field is entering our sphere, or at least we can imagine it that way. And on the other side, we see a lot more smaller electric field lines leaving the sphere. And it turns out that for electric field specifically, it is always true that the amount of electric field entering our imaginary surface has to equal the amount of electric field leaving our imaginary surface. The amount coming in always has to balance out exactly the amount going out. And this is always true except for when our imaginary surface is surrounding a charged particle. A positive charge is known as the source of an electric field, which means that electric field lines originate from a positive charge. And if we find a positive electric charge within our imaginary sphere, then the net effect is that electric field lines are said to be leaving the sphere. Conversely, a negative electric charge is said to be a sink of electric field lines in that electric field lines end at negative charges. Therefore, if a negative charge is found within our imaginary sphere, then the net effect is that electric field lines are actually entering our sphere. And as we've already seen in any other region where there are no charged particles within our sphere, the net effect is that the amount coming in exactly cancels out the amount going out. The reason that the electric field behaves in this way is specifically because of this Maxwell equation. If you haven't seen my video covering this Maxwell equation, then check it out up here. Now in this Maxwell equation, we can see that the del operator is indeed operating, but it's no longer acting as the gradient operator. And we can see that specifically because of this little dot in between the del and the E representing the electric field. This dot is representing a dot product or a scalar product between del and the electric field E. For those of you not familiar with the dot product between two vectors, it's when you take the corresponding components from the two vectors, multiply them together, and then add up all these little products. But in this situation, where the first vector is the del, what we actually do is apply the partial derivative to the corresponding component of the electric field. And remember that the electric field is a vector field. And what we've just seen is how to find the divergence of our electric field. Even though we see a del in this location, we're no longer taking the gradient as we saw earlier with the scalar field. We're now taking the divergence of the vector field. And that's all changed simply by this little dot. And when we take the divergence of a vector field, what we end up with is a scalar field. In this particular case, it tells us exactly how much electric field is entering or leaving a particular point. And this is slightly different to the gradient operator from earlier because the gradient operator is applied to a scalar field and gives us a vector field. Now we've seen how we can take a dot product between del and a vector field. And as it turns out, we can also find the cross product. For a moment, if we think about two arbitrary vectors and we try and find the cross product or the vector product between them, the end result is usually a third vector perpendicular to the first two. That is also a measure of how unaligned the two vectors are. And this is what I mean by that. The size of the vector that we get by taking the cross product between the first two vectors will be as large as possible if the first two vectors are orthogonal to each other or at right angles to each other. Whereas if the two original vectors are exactly aligned or exactly anti-aligned, then the vector resulting from the cross product will have a size of zero. But if we now come back to thinking about vector fields and del, we can find the cross product between del and a vector field. And in this case, things are slightly different. The cross product, also known as the curl of the vector field, is a measure of the circulation of our vector field. Let's imagine that our vector field is representing some sort of fluid flow. Let's say some water flowing in like a lake. And in this water, we drop some sort of plastic fan. At every point in our vector field, we can measure the rotation that this fan would experience. 
and whether it will rotate clockwise or anti-clockwise. Now we can represent the rotation of our fan with another vector that points along the axis of rotation. A common convention is to say that if the fan rotates clockwise, then our vector representation will point downward. And if it rotates anti-clockwise, then it will point up towards us. And the size or magnitude of this vector represents the size or magnitude of the rotation. And this is exactly what we measure when we apply the curl operator to our original vector field. The end result is another vector field that represents the axes of rotation of each part of the original fluid flow in this case. It's important to note though that the rotation is not a property of the fan, it's actually the fluid flow that's causing our imaginary fan to rotate. And therefore the curl is actually measuring something about the original vector field. And so bringing it all the way around, we earlier saw that when we apply gradient to a scalar field, the end result is a vector field. When we apply divergence to a vector field, the end result is a scalar field. And when we apply curl to a vector field, the end result is a vector field. But it's also important to understand what each one of these represents. Now in physics, all three of these operators are used very regularly. For example, the gradient of a scalar field phi is directly related to the gravitational field produced by some object with mass. And in this particular case, the scalar field phi is known as the gravitational potential. Now in this case, we've got a negative sign because the rate of increase of the gravitational potential points in the opposite direction to the gravitational field itself. But we can see the use of the grad operator on a scalar field in this particular instance. In electromagnetism, we've seen that Maxwell's equations deal with electric and magnetic fields. And we've already seen one of these equations earlier in the video. But another one tells us that if our theory of classical electromagnetism is correct, then the divergence of the magnetic field is always zero. In other words, there are no lone sources or sinks of the magnetic field. For more information on this, check out my video on that Maxwell equation. And finally, another Maxwell equation tells us that the curl of the electric field is equal to minus the time rate of change of the magnetic field. In this way, we see an intricate link between electric and magnetic fields, and we see also the use of the curl operator. For more information on that Maxwell equation, check out this video up here. And with all of that being said, I'm going to finish up here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Hit the bell button if you'd like to be notified when I upload, and please do check out my Patreon page if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you as always for your wonderful support, and I will see you very soon.